Hi, this is James Garner, the Senior Tech Geek, and I'm here from Walter from Photochem. And Walter, well, he's actually graded a number of high dynamic range features, uh, San Andreas being probably the most well-known one. Yeah, we, we just finished the um, uh, Parkour Henry, also okay. in uh, high dynamic range at Dolby, at the Vine. Fantastic. So, fantastic opportunity to get someone who is actually doing high dynamic range today. So I thought we'd ask him a few questions about the learning process and see if, see if he can uh, help the rest of the industry in terms of what paths to go down and what not to go down when we're going to learn the new art of doing high dynamic range. And it is something that we have to learn and it'll take a process to learn it. And he has experience, he's been through that process. So Walter, can you shed some light and tell us your experience going down this path? When we went to the San Andrea project, we really have no idea how to approach it. So. Uh, for the first time we say okay we have a lot more exposure a lot more latitude we want to take advantage of it so we finish the project for the normal theatrical distribution and we export a full logarithmic EXR 32-bit to take a, any single information that we had yep. and bring it to the next stage That's right. then we try to map the the bulk of the color space as if we are doing a theatrical exhibition yes. And we expand the highlights, uh, especially in all the outdoor scene, they, they're really nicely. Yes. Uh, but then we found out that the director of photography will not lead in that way a scene. Really? Because the subject start to feel underexposed if you only take advantage of the highlights. Right. So the, the more we were working on San Andrea and uh, in um, Arco Henry even more, I think the approach on HDR is to remap in your entire tonal range on, on this new open kind of a light environment where you're not just stretching a little bit or adding a little bit of black, but you actually you need to remap and you rethink the light. I don't want to say like if you're in a monitor because you're not in a monitor environment, it's a very immersive experience. Um, we need to kind of uh, relearn how to look at the image. Yeah. When you are in a you know in a normal 14 foot Lambert or yeah. whatever unit you want to use it, you tend to be cautious of your subjects, and you know you cannot show everything in the highlights. You tend to flat them out yeah. or flat the blacks. Yeah. You can't just open them. It doesn't work. Really. Especially if you don't shoot in that way. If you don't shoot with HDR in mind. You, you want to still have your subject the main focus. Yes. Otherwise, you lose yourself to look at this beautiful sky, and there is a man there talking in the corner. Oh, wait, that's what I'm supposed to look at. That's right. <laughs> so, it, it, refocusing the attention to what's important for the story was it was kind of a challenge the first time around. It was it was a surprise for us. So that that's fantastic. That sort of you know how to approach that um, in terms of if you're jumping into high dynamic range and I, I expect a lot will in the coming year due to the amazing traction it's a very much the high dynamic range year at NAB. Um, you mentioned just then that uh, the way the content is acquired and shot can you give us some you know some comments on what sort of points would you say to help people who are at the cameraman who are now shooting high dynamic range from your perspective as a colorist what points would you, you give them if they were asking you that today? Well, the first thing, everybody know how to hide the problem. Like, uh, I know there is nothing outside of the window. I'm just going to blow out the window so I don't see it. Yeah, that's right. Or I'm in a studio, so I don't want to see them in a studio. Well, in a dynamic range, you will see that. Yeah. So you, you can't cheat as much <laughs> as before. Right. <laughs> um, what about the, the darks and the low, the low end? How do we treat I, that? I think there is less problem in the, in the low end. Uh, I will probably suggest to uh, to fill up, to, to have the fill light a little bit more uh, than what you usually do, because the dark tend to go down really fast. Right. And uh, it's we were doing some tests on on a monitor for HDR yeah. for some uh, horror movie, and it's great because you can do you can go on those deep blacks where there is still the feeling of some texture, but really you are looking for something that is dark. That's right. Uh, for a comedy, it's counterintuitive. You want to fill the lights a little bit more, otherwise it tends to be really, really contrast to the final image. So keep your keep in mind that your highlights will show what yes. you usually don't see. 
uh, keep in mind that if you shoot too much of it, now the relationship between your highlights, your key, fill, and dark, it's off. The subject tend to be underexposed. Okay. So backlit become a challenge uh, because you get overpowered by the window and fixed in post start to be not an option because it becomes dim at that point. Right. You don't take advantage of any of the HDR because now you you lose the relationship with those highlights. Well, that does. That, your comments are very insightful because it does sort of really drive the fact that HDR monitoring on set is going to become a very important. You aspect. have to. You yes. have to monitor with with a proper set of transformation lat, whatever you want to call it. You kind of want to preview what's going on That's right. in, in, in places where usually you don't care and actually you hide things. That's now right, you, you, can't can't hide them, you can't hide them anymore. <laughs> and 